Well, it's lovely to see you. Here we are at King Edward's Whitley. Uh, you, you've settled in, I think it is, to your new role as, as the, the head of cricket. Although you did tell me you've been doing a bit of water polo as well, which is very exciting. News. Um, how are you? Very good, very good. Um, settled in brilliantly. Uh, staff are fantastic, kids have been fantastic. Um, and obviously learning new skills, as you mentioned, with the water polo and, and a few other sports. So yeah. I'm honestly having a, a while of a time. Amazing place as well. We, we, we Phil very kindly gave us a, a tour earlier, but it's an unbelievable setup in there, isn't it? It is. Um, you know, obviously you've seen the facilities. Um, there's a big, big emphasis on um, sport here at the school. Um, there's been a lot of investment going in. Um, we've got some very talented boys and girls um, in, in all departments and, and all sports at, at the school. Uh, so it's been very exciting to see in, in the short period I've been here so far. And how, how is it? Uh, you did say to me you're not quite used to everybody calling you Sir or Mr. Clark. <laughs> How's that side of things been so far? Getting better, yeah. uh, but still uh, a bit alien. <laughs> if I'm if I'm brutally honest, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, getting used to that sort of um, situation of people calling you calling you Sir and Mr. Clark. Because um, I've always been just known as, as Ricky Clark. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it, it's, I'm getting used to it. Finally, you're getting the respect you deserve. So there you are. Um, okay, then we've had what? What have we? We're probably about seven, eight weeks, a couple of months since the end of the season. You've had a bit of breathing space now. Obviously, it was all very emotional at the end. Um, just looking back now, with with that sort of break on your career as Ricky Clark, I should think you are incredibly proud of everything you achieved in the game, aren't you? Yeah, I think going back to that that final day, it sort of um, hit home a couple of days after, where I, I sort of looked back and thought, "Hang on a minute, I've been given a guard of honour by Glamorgan." Um, all the nice messages that I received on social media um, and everywhere, really, um, and then to have a guard of honour and a standing ovation walking off that field, I, I sort of looked back and thought, "I've actually potentially done something right in the game." I, I know I've sort of entertained a lot of people and. and been that sort of figure in cricket um, to warrant that um, and uh, you know as I said and, and you know as well that I was very overwhelmed by it um, and it's, it's just quite pleasing that you know the career that I always sort of set out to have I achieved it and I can look back very fondly and, and um, very proudly of, of what I achieved in, in the game. Now, I always when anybody asks me about Ricky Clark's career I always talk about the three stages of Ricky Clark Talented youngster, incredibly talented youngster of Surrey. Breaks into an England team at a very young age. Probably lost his way a little bit, if, it's, if we were being honest. Yeah. Went to Warwickshire, learned his game, and then came back to Surrey as the finished article. Would that be a fair summation of, of your career, do you think? A hundred percent. I think it's sort of well documented in those early stages that I was that sort of talented youngster coming through. I burst on the scene, as, as people call it, um, in my first season after, what was it, nine first-class matches. I found myself on an England tour with, let's be honest, some England greats, Nasser Hussain, um, Alex Stewart, uh, Nick Knight, people like these guys that have been in the England setup for a long time. And there I was as a 20-year-old on an England tour, walking through um, the hotel with, of the Champions Trophy, because everyone's staying at the same hotel in Sri Lanka, and there's Ricky Ponting, Shane Warne, Sachin Tendulkar, and I was a bit, what am I doing here? I played nine first class matches. Um, so there was that sort of, did it come too soon? It probably did. Um, and then I sort of lost my way and then there was that expectation of, you're an England player now, you should be delivering consistently. Um, but I was still, if I'm honest, a, a young club coming into the game. Um, and I was still trying to find my feet. And then there was that situation when I moved away, it was uh, a great chance for me to sort of reignite my career, so to speak. Um, didn't quite go according to plan at Derbyshire, but then I owe Warwickshire a massive amount of, sort of credit to my career because Ashley Giles and Graham Welsh and Jim Trout, who was captain at the time, they grabbed me and they said, where do you want to go? What do you want to do with your career? Um, because you've got a great opportunity. I think I was 26 or seven at the time, potentially. Um, and if it wasn't for them, if I'm brutally honest, I feel I potentially could have been out of the game, probably at the age of 30, 31. But they grabbed me um, and I worked incredibly hard. And I think that, that was the stage as well that when I started, I, I sort of relied on natural ability and talent and there's a lot of hype around me. When I got a bit older, um, I probably matured a little bit later 
and I realised what I needed to do to actually be a successful cricketer in the game um, and that I owe them massive credit for that. If you've been in that dressing room when the young Ricky Clark was here, what would you have seen now? So if you've been sat there as Ricky Clark now and the young Ricky Clark have walked into the Surrey dressing room as this incredibly talented youngster, what, what, what would you have seen? you think, as the mature <laughs> cricketer you are now? Uh, as a mature cricketer now, if a young Ricky Clark walked in, um, I'm not sure you can give him a clip around the year nowadays, <laughs> can you? Um, look, I think I would have looked at a, a very talented individual that needed guidance, um, needed a certain way of being managed. Um, I know that I was never easy when I was a youngster. Um, I had a bit of an attitude about me, a bit of arrogance, um, but people said that was good because you know, I walked into a very successful Surrey dressing room with a lot of successful cricketers. Like we had an international lineup. We had 12, 13, 14 men sitting out that had God knows how many international caps. Um, so it was quite a daunting dressing room to walk into, but it was a good one because everyone was willing to help you. Um, so if a, a young Ricky Clark walked in and you know, I was that, that sort of senior guy, I think it would have been a stage of trying to nurture that talent early. Um, would he have listened? Who knows? Um, but I think I look back and wish that I'd sort of gone about my career in those early stages my way. So um, I like to think I've always been very respectful of, of everyone, um, well-mannered. Um, so I always wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing and, and pleasing everyone where actually fundamentally I think if I'd gone about my cricket my way, then that might have actually helped me progress and potentially play for England a lot more. Um, because back then it's completely different to what it is now. Coaches talk a lot more now and the, the players' interests are at heart where I had four or five different coaches. So I, was at, I had Surrey coaches, England A Academy, England coaches. Everyone was telling me a lot of different things and it was just that sort of stage of, well, what am I doing? Because I was getting mixed messages. I was changing a lot. So I didn't want to be known as that youngster who thinks he knows it all and he's cracked the game. Um, but fundamentally, I sort of changed um, for, for other people's sake and it didn't really benefit my game. And that's the, that's where I sort of lost my way a little bit. I mean. With England, a couple of test matches in there, one day internationals. But looking back now, and I've heard a few people say this, with the talent that you had, and we know you, you should have been earning as many test caps as Andrew Clinton, basically. Do you look back on that with, with regret now, or are you still, you should still be very proud of an England career, but, but with the cricketer that you became, would you have liked to have had that go again with the cricketer that you were midway and back end of your, your career? Um, definitely. Look, it's always difficult when you look at it, you have to be proud of what you achieve. I've, I've played 22 times for England. You know, Alex Stewart said many a time I should have played 75 test matches and 150 ODIs. The fact of the matter is I didn't. Um, I have to take responsibility for that myself. Um, but at the same point, particularly with that sort of England set up at the time, I don't feel like I did get a fair crack of the whip. Um, and it was a stage where we were going through lots of cricketers. If you didn't do it straight away, you were out and someone else was in. I think, again, now talking about coaching and, and looking after the cricketers coming through, People are given more time now. Um, I, can, I can look quite fondly back on my test career, and I'll be very happy with my averages. And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. they will go to the, to the grave with me. Um, ODIs that I, I could have done better, um, but again, I think I batted in, in 20 ODIs. I had 13 innings. I think I batted five or six different positions in the, in those 13 innings. So there was no sort of continuity of role or, or what I was basically looking to do. Um, in, in the role and um, it was just a little bit sort of everywhere so that that was quite difficult um, but yeah I, I look back on me and say that I, I managed to put on the uh, three lines in, in in a couple of formats and um, I can take that and say you know I could it could have been better a um, bit like my school reports could have been better um, but it was uh, very enjoyable to wear those shirts but but with what you've been saying there coming into this job here bringing that experience in because you'll be working here with a lot of talented young kids, yeah, boys and girls, yeah, and with what you've just said there, that that experience you can pass pass that knowledge on to them. Hundred percent. I think I've always looked at it now, going into a role like this and, and with my academy, that I will not be a coach that would change things for the sake of changing things. You know, 
I've, I've always believed that um, a Malinga or a Bumra would not make it in an English setup because it'd be coached out of them. So I think it's a case of actually look at what people have got. Can you slightly tinker to make it better? But fundamentally, you know, um, giving them the opportunity to be more consistent. Um, James Anderson, well documented years ago, his action changed. Yeah. He then got, I think, it was a double stressy uh, of, of the back, and he went, Do you know what? And, and in fairness, credit to him, he was one that early doors went, No, right. this is what I've done all, all my sort of youth career. This is what got me picked in the first place. Went back to it, and the numbers now speak, speak for itself. So I think it's a case of actually identifying um, young talent, what has made them successful to get where they are now, and then just make them better. You need to get to know your game, though. When did the penny drop? When, when, when for Ricky Clark did the penny drop? Because, as I said, I've seen all your career. Incredibly talented youngster. Then you went away, had that season at Derbyshire, then went to Warwickshire. And I can remember seeing you when you were playing for Warwickshire and thinking the penny's dropped there. A couple of years in, the penny dropped. He knows his role, he knows what his job is in the side. With your bowling as well, you look more controlled. Um, he knew what your action was. When did, did sort of that penny drop? And who, who was the influence on you for that penny to drop? Well, growing well, yeah. first and foremost, um, particularly for my bowling, it was a situation where I'd always had the role, as you, you've followed my career for many years, that when I was younger, I bowled quick, yeah. you know, 93 miles an hour. It was always a case of a role. Clarky, we need him out, running, bowl fast, intimidating, get him out, and then it'd be Vickers or Saki or whoever else would come on, and then, you know, get people out with their, their control. Um, and then when I went to Warwickshire, Graham Welsh grabbed me and said, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? I said, well, I've always been classed as a genuine all-rounder. I want to bowl overs, stay on, bowl economically and, and take wickets. So we basically said, right, and we, we sat down, worked out a plan, and it was a case of, right, we're going to put cones out, we're going to put a target, and every, every morning, half an hour before anyone was even at the ground, I was up early, I was there, and I just worked incredibly hard and honing a skill. Um, I didn't worry about in-swing or wobble seam. In fairness, wobble seam wasn't a massive thing back then. Um, but it was a case of standing the seam up, looking to shape the ball, um, went back to my original action, and it was a case of just bashing line and length. Um, and I did that every morning. Then it was a case of when I got an opportunity in the game, do exactly the same. And then just from there, it sort of snowballed and then uh, became that sort of, Ricky Clark, the consistent county pro who doesn't bowl bad balls and just, you know, does a job for the team. Yeah, and with the bat as well at Warwickshire, I always thought they sort of slotted you in the right place as well at, at that time of your and I always when you were coming in at six, seven or eight, I always thought it's quite a nice safety valve to have Clark wandering in at six, seven or eight. But but again that I always got the impression that they were playing you where you wanted to, to play behind a very talented top order as well there. Oh well, yeah, well we had Ian Bell, Jonathan Trot. Um, Jim Trout was in there, Tim Ambrose, you know, again, international. So I've been very fortunate through my career that I've played with some amazing players and um, amazing teams that have won trophies. Um, but it was it was almost, uh, again, Ashley Giles should take a lot of credit for that because it was all about my time management. And I, as I said, I was working with, with, with Pop Welsh on my bowling. Um, I had a great captain in uh, Jim Trout who understood me and knew that I was a little bit different, knew that, you know, I wasn't going to do everything by the book. Um, but he understood that and sort of a side that embraced that. Um, and then with Ashley Giles, it was like, right, we're going to be this time every morning. You're going to have your 15 minute hit. You off to do your, you, you've done your bowling with, with Pop or whatever time sort of works out. Then we get your slip fielding done. That's your time management. Stick to it, do it. And that, that sort of helped me because I've always been someone that likes structure. Yeah. I like to say, you tell me where I need to be, I'll be there and I'll do it and, and stuff. And then that just developed that. You know, there was one time I was sat having breakfast and uh, the door was pushed open and Jilo's coming and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm having breakfast. He went, what's the time? And I was like, oh. and I knew that, you know, I'd messed up and it was a case of I won't do it again. And um, that helped me because it just gave me a lot of structure. Um, people called it ticking the boxes, but I'd actually prepared myself ready for games. Um, so whatever happened in the game, I knew that I'd prepared right and you're not a robot, you're not going to get wickets all the time if all well, you're not going to get runs all the time. Um, but at least I know that I prepared myself for games of cricket to succeed, and more often than not, that helped me uh, to, to get that sort of consistency in my game. Yeah, won everything at Warwickshire. 
can I ask you? Was was there a, was there always a hope in your back of the mind that I might finish my career at Surrey? Well, Alex Stewart sort of knew so because <laughs> the, the day I signed for Warwick, it was always like, "When are you coming back? <laughs> when are you coming, coming back?" back? Um, look, if I think again, it's well documented. I didn't want to leave Surrey. I always wanted to be a one county man. Um, do the from the start to the end. You know, have you have a testimonial and you know in an ideal world a gate like Stewie's got all that sort of stuff um, and it just didn't work out that way so I always hoped that I'd go back but if I'm brutally honest Warwickshire were fantastic yeah. really good for me um, but for it to sort of materialise in a way where Warwickshire were going down a different direction they were looking to get rid of the old guard so to speak and start afresh um, and then obviously the first phone call was Stewie I'm available and he said 100% and it just sort of worked out brilliantly and then to come back and obviously win a trophy in, in, in the first season and I did you know, play a massive role in that yeah. it was quite pleasing uh, and just to see what it meant for all the, all the supporters because I've been associated with Surrey from the age of under nine all the way up so you know it is home um, it always will be home and um, it was quite pleasing to, to have that sort of finale uh, in my career finishing that season because I can remember when you because you came initially on loan didn't you the, the second half of 2017 yeah. the season and I can remember when when it was sort of announced, thinking, "A, brilliant to have him back, and B, that's the last piece of the jigsaw. That that that's what they've been setting themselves up for to, to get him in now." And then that 2018 season, like, look, you've won championships before then, but I would have thought winning that championship in 2018, having come back and doing it with a great set of lads as well, back at Surrey, I, I would have thought that was incredible. Wasn't it? it was just on the basis, and you know, Jay Dernbach, a massive mate of mine, just to see what it meant to him. Um, you know, 16 years since we, we'd won a, a trophy um, in the championship before, so and I was part of that 2002 one. So, you know, for me, it was it was very pleasing to see what it meant to so many people, having had a couple of them already in, in, in the trophy cabinet myself. But it was very pleasing to see what it meant because it's a lot of hard work, it's not just a you know, in comes Mornay Morkel and Ricky Clark and, you know, we won a trophy. Those guys worked incredibly hard to have a structure of what you need to do um, and a process of, of that end goal. Um, so it was very pleasing for those guys because they, they put a lot of effort into it um, and it was just, you know, very rewarding to have a sort of slight um, influence in, in that. Yeah, and, and to, to do it back at Keir Oval, which is basically your home, second home, isn't it? And, and I remember that back in 2018, that last game against Essex. Unbelievable the game of cricket. And obviously Essex getting over the line right at the end, but then all the members in the, the pavilion and the song we shows the perfect day, was it? A bit like your last day. <laughs> talk about that. But but that 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 must have also to be stood there with, and there's the photo of you with the trophy, with the pavilion in the background. To, to, to have that back at back at home again was was, was second to none, wasn't it? Well, brilliant. Um, as you say, I think. We obviously won the trophy at Worcester, so to have the supporters there and the photos, and you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's like it's yeah. a family. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just a green club; it's a family. Um, so, you know, the, the great game that we had, sky cameras were there as well. The weather, as you say, it was fantastic, and then to obviously get the trophy um, in, in front of our home supporters um, and the members, it was just you know very very special. What was it like? I don't know if you can remember, but you, you mentioned New Road there. It got a bit wobbly. It got a bit wobbly, and then it was you and Morde. What, 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 what? Did, I know it's a while ago now, but what were you two doing in that? Because obviously, sorry, win, win today, that's the championship done, then wickets fell. What were you two saying to each other at that point? Was it, it came across as quite a bit of relief when you did get over the line. Yeah, well, if I'm brutally honest, we were quite relaxed. I think Mornay's been there, done it, seen it. I like think I've been there, done it, seen it as well. So it was always a case of, you know, just stay calm. We're going to get the balls and, and get the runs we need. Um, and, and sort of, yeah, it, it, we were very uh, in control of the situation. Um, I don't think the balcony could, <laughs> could see it that way. It, it, we were looking up, it, it looked quite nervous. But from our point of view, we were very relaxed. Um, I actually remember I had one on the hip and I missed it. And um, I was you know, uh, but I think it was fitting that Mornay hit the winning runs because that season he was fantastic. I think it was 10 matches, 58 wickets. And he, realistically, if I'm brutally honest, yes, everyone contributed, but without Mornay, I think it would have been a potentially different 
different season for us, um, but he was he was fantastic through the whole season. Yeah, and that final season, the final season that you just had, um, that that last day against Glamorgan, we 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 spoken about it an awful lot. A, you know, I was worried you weren't going to get through the day without crying the entire day. <laughs> Uh, B, it probably wasn't the final game you'd envisaged. The fact you'd been in the dirt for 140 overs or whatever it was going into that last day. Um, but what was what was that like? What was that like? And and just explain to everybody because I think well, this is a great thing that you know you weren't expecting to go in at tea time, and a certain world jacks came to you and said you've got to go in. Yeah. Um, what what was what was that like? Walking out to that guard of honour when you walked off at the end. And, home fans can you stand in the face well first of all it was 177 over was it 167 right? it was I, you know, to be honest with you, I was done after I did the so I didn't have that on the radar mm. at all um, the, and then yeah the, the situation where we, we got to tea and uh, Jacko come up and said you have to go and I was like look, look, look. it's a normal game of cricket and um, just go about it normally and he was like no you have to go and then loads of other lads come in Clarky you got to go and I was like well, I'm not going to be the one to make that decision. Go speak to, to Vic and Stewie. And they were like, if you want to go, you're going. And I was like, okay, look, I'll go. Um, and then, yeah, from that point, I, I just, everything that happened, I was a bit, wow. It, it was sort of a, a wow moment. Walking out, um, the crowd, and then seeing Glamorgan, obviously, because they were changing over the far side, sprinting over to do a guard of honour, the umpires, uh, walking through, I was like, you know, very overwhelmed by it all. Um, and then I'll probably say the most nervous delivery I've ever faced in my life. Because I thought, <laughs> you can't walk out here, guard of honour, yeah. and then get out first ball. Yeah. <laughs> so I was literally, I just get and that got, on it. <laughs> you've got, you've got a hate rather for bowling. <laughs> exactly, well. yeah. I would have rather like show him back to yeah, her yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. But part time, left arm off spinner. And I was like, whatever you do, get the pads out of the way, use the bat. Um, so managed to get through that. And then uh, once we got off the mark, I was like, you know, relieved and just went about it as, as normal. And, and, and after it as well, you were there, knocked out at the end, walked off, guard of honour from your teammates, and then Jade wandered yes. through as well. And, and we all know how close you were, Jade. They've already been through your careers together, but that must have been a lovely moment as well, seeing Jade come through. Yeah. Massively. You know, again, he's someone that basically bleeds, bleeds brown, basically, sorry. He's just one of those guys that, you know, wears his heart on his sleeve, give everything to the calls. Um, we've been best mates for years and, and we'll continue to be best mates. So from, from that point of view, um, although I feel he's got some more years left in him to play, but to, to finish together and, and retire at the same time and walk through that card of honour was, was very, very special. Yeah, now I don't want you to get emotional again here. So, <laughs> You're talking family. But, yeah, <laughs> but you've done this with me a couple of times, so you should be fine now. But yeah, how, how important have the family been as well, to, to, you know, throughout the career, basically? Yeah, massively. Look, they, they say behind um, every successful man is a, a, an understanding wife, and I, I have that. Um, you know, she's been brilliant, Harriet, um, throughout my whole career, moving all around the country a lot of the time, um, always sort of backing me up with everything, everything I've done. And then the kids, just fantastic. Um, just, you know, to me, um, and to them, sorry, I'm, I'm just daddy. That, that's pretty much, uh, they don't see any of the limelight. They see sometimes when they've been at games, why do they want a photo or an autograph? They don't really understand it. Um, but, you know, to, to, family's always important in, in everything you do. Um, so from my point of view, to have them there on that day, I didn't actually know they were they were coming. And I got a text message from, from Harriet and she was like, what a lovely view. And I was like, who said that? Uh -huh. I like, just totally oblivious, straight over my head. And she went, come out and look up. I went, no. <laughs> God, I knew that I'd probably just break down in tears again. Yeah. So I was like, no. She was like, oh, please. I was like, no, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, and then it was just a, a situation where, yeah, obviously went up and see him, gave him a hug and uh, yeah, walking off after that, that guard of honour and standing ovation, they're up in the box. Um, yeah, quite emotional. Yeah, but you mentioned your family there, the Surrey family you mentioned as well, you know. <laughs> Again, how important have the Surrey fans, members been to you throughout your career? Because, you know, they are they are so loyal and they, they, they do support you through thick and thin. And I know how delighted they were when you came back. So how important has that Surrey family been? Oh, massively. Um, you know, it's a situation where I think cricket's a lot different to some other sports. You know, you, 
you interact with supporters a lot more, um, particularly when you're in hotels and away games, you know, you can have a drink and a chat, um, and also eat awards even and stuff like that. So from my point of view, the fans have always been very welcoming and very supportive of me, um, and I can't thank them enough for that. And they're very supportive to anyone who, who walks out uh, and gives their all to, to the free feather. And supporting in your testimonial as well, which is, you know, we've still got a bit to go, but but, but going well, the, the, the testimony, under under difficult circumstances with the pandemic and everything, but it's yeah. been, been successful here. Yeah, I don't like to do things easy. No, um, no but it's, it's going really well. And obviously we've got a few more events coming up. Um, and the support that I've received from, from everyone um, associated with the club and away from the club has been fantastic. Um, so, from my point of view, it's uh, two amazing charities that we're supporting as well. So, um, hopefully have a, a nice, successful year. I've got a question for you now. I've always wanted to ask you, and I've saved it up for this. Right, we, we, we all know what you're like, Gatchi. Yes. <laughs> Does that come, that, that obviously is a natural talent and you're one of the best I've ever seen. But how much practice did you put in as well, or was it just complete? Because wherever they stuck you in the field, you knew what you knew what you were getting. But I think most people will think, "Ah, oh, Clark slips." Was it? Did it always just come to you naturally? Um, do you know the funny thing? When I was a, a youngster, just at Godalming mean, down the road, funny enough, um, I was always up a cricket field, literally seven days a week. I was up a cricket field. Um, and the weekends, obviously, be games and, and stuff, and then the youth games during during the um, weekday. And I was always grabbing someone and saying, "Look, come and hit me a ball." Um, I used to get the you know the boundary. Remember the boundary marker? Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to get a boundary marker, pop them either side, and I could just grab someone and say, "Right, you're going out to the square. You're hitting it along the floor, and I've got to stop it." So yeah. building was always a massive part of something that I enjoyed and wanted to do, and it just sort of progressed from there. Um, and then when I went obviously professional, I was pretty much a backward point, very athletic and stuff like that. Um, and then I think there's a situation where people knew I had good hands and it was like, look, we've got to get them in the slips. Um, went in the slips and just worked hard from there, basically to, you know, it, it, getting better is all about volume. The more you do something, you, you get better. Um, so it was always a case of, uh, I worked incredibly hard on the, on the slip field and enjoyed it a lot. Because you were the first one I saw, I remember, with Harbourjet, going from slip to leg slip on the sweep. Yeah. Um, and was, was that something that you'd spoken to Harbajan about, or was that just just uh, first out? I saw the shot. I think we were at Tunbridge Wells against Kent. I think it was. Oh, memory, there's a paddle sweep, and, and I yeah, yeah. Just gone. No, so there's nothing spoken about. It's just a case of I don't know. I've always liked to think that I've had quite decent game management and understanding, and just basically saw him go down to paddle, and I just set off. And luckily, I had a long enough arm just to grab it. Is is there, is there one catch though that sort of sticks in the clock? memory bank where when you took it you thought that's an absolute beauty. Oh, it's hard to say. I've, without being big enough, I've taken some good shots. <laughs> I'll be honest, um, you've taken some absolute bounces over the years. I think there was there was one I remember in a T20 against uh, Middlesex in maybe mid two, uh, 2004, maybe five. I think it was, um, I don't know if it was Weeks. Was it Paul Weeks? Paul Weeks. And sort of backed away in a T20 and it sort of uppercut it and I've just sort of gone up and somehow it stuck. So that was that was quite a decent one that sort of stuck in in my memory. Um, Lehman at Guildford, I think that was 2002. I was at third slip and it just wasn't quite carrying a second and sort of died and got it off the ground. But um, yeah, I probably could name all of them yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have we got mate? That's yeah. the problem. How long yeah. have we got? Number 26. Number was. 26. Was. <laughs> Finally, now, I've just asked you there about your best catch. And I could sit here and ask you about your best innings, best shot you ever played, best wicket you ever took. But I, I would have thought with over a 20 year career, the things you're going to remember are teammates, clubs you paid for, and being part of that cricketing circus for, for your career. Massively. Um, you know, we've already alluded to the friendship and, and stuff with Jade. Um, but the number of cricketers I could mention that will basically be friends for life through the game of cricket. Um, and all I ever sort of wanted to achieve was, can I leave whoever I played for in a better place? You know, can I create a legacy with my teammates um, that basically leaves that, that side in, in a better place? And hopefully I like to think that my time at Surrey the first time round, then at Warwickshire and then finishing at Surrey, um, I've done that. So I can look back fondly. Um, with the friendships I've made, 
people that I've met, yourself included, for, for many years, um, which actually gives you that friendship for life.